countries. So what they're doing is really very simple. They get the information in one end from who gives it to them and out the other with sometimes minimal interference. Julian Assange is the leader of that, the mastermind, the creator, and really because he thinks of it as a journalistic enterprise, the editor-in-chief. But every story starts with a source, and Assange has some unconventional sources. Julian Assange does not hack as far as we know. He is the recipient of people who are either insiders who give him secret documents or hack emails from a foreign power. That's Eli Lake. I am a columnist for Bloomberg. And there was no source bigger for Assange than Chelsea Manning. He used to be known as U.S. soldier Bradley Manning. In 2010, Manning provided Assange and WikiLeaks with hundreds of thousands of leaked government documents. WikiLeaks quietly began releasing the documents in February of 2010 then made big headlines in April by posting what is now known as the collateral murder video. Come on, fire! It was a vivid, graphic video. It changed the debate on the Iraq war, and importantly, it put WikiLeaks on the map when they put it online, and they couldn't be ignored at that point. And those leaks were just the beginning. They went on to post more than 90,000 leaked documents known as the Afghan war logs, 390,000 documents known as the Iraq war logs, and a quarter of a million private messages between diplomats called cables in what is now known as Cablegate. These leaks were met with very real ethical questions. The problem with publishing those cables was that a number of confidential sources for U.S. diplomats who faced real danger when their names were exposed. Then Secretary of State Hillary Clinton drove the point home that every country, including the United States, must be able to have candid conversations about the people and nations with whom they deal. Shortly after Cablegate, the Swedish government issued an arrest warrant for Assange on allegations of rape and molestation. He claimed the allegations were fabricated to get him extradited to the United States, a claim the U.S. government denied. Either way, Assange's next move was to seek refuge in the Ecuadorian embassy, uh, which really was the beginning of the new chapter in his life and what we're dealing with now, which is him being stuck in London. What was supposed to be an office in an embassy is now Assange's self-imposed prison to this very day. But that doesn't mean he's slowed down. Since being trapped in the embassy, WikiLeaks has released files about Guantanamo Bay prisoners, Syrian political figures, and the draft to the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And then came the 2016 U.S. election. Thousands of leaked emails show Democratic Party officials possibly plotting against Bernie Sanders in his race against Hillary Clinton. Over the course of 68 days, WikiLeaks released 20,000 confidential Democratic National Committee emails. In terms of the presidential race, if you look right here, when Assange released the first batch of emails, Trump actually takes his first lead against Clinton. I think we've had enough of the Clintons in all fairness. Once WikiLeaks started exposing secrets of the Democratic Party, Julian Assange became a hero to many on the right. Public opinion kind of flip-flopped. WikiLeaks! From the emails, we now know Hillary Clinton's campaign manager makes risotto, and also how the DNC squashed Bernie Sanders' campaign. One thing we don't know is who gave Assange the stolen emails in the first place. Many leading Democrats say they suspect it was the Russians. They released an analysis from a private cybersecurity firm that had said it was the Russians. But Assange claims... Our source uh, is not the Russian government, uh, and it is not a state party. So this is where we stand today. The public still doesn't know who provided the emails to WikiLeaks. Meanwhile, Assange is still running WikiLeaks and still releasing documents. In March 2017, he started publishing documents from the CIA's Center for Cyber Intelligence called Vault 7. The CIA, the agency charged with finding and keeping our top secrets, can't keep its own secrets. As long as Assange has a connection to the world, no government secret will be too far from exposure. Julian Assange is still in the embassy. Maybe he'll leave, maybe he won't. Kind of regardless, his work has been done. He's changed the way people think about their governments, about their own secrets, about their own hackability, and really the world has changed because of him.
when it debuted, the 4G wireless we have today allowed people for the first time to hit the road and explore unknown places with only a smartphone for directions. When 5G arrives, it could enable driverless cars to take us there Daniel as well. Filmus, 5G is stands in charge for of the fifth generation in Argentina, or says his government is going to continue to push for negotiation. But the reason it's being called revolutionary is because 5G will allow connected devices to speak to each other as well as... Europe has a change in its position on the island. Right now we're living in a world where... a similar case of the UN and the Chagos Archipelago. The UK lost 114 to 6 in 6 months to return the island to Mauritius. The only EU country to vote for the UK was Hungary. What we're being told about 5G is that really, for the first time, we're going to see machines communicating with each other over mobile networks in a meaningful way. 5G could end up being 100 times faster than what we have now, with speeds that could reach 20 gigabits per second. In plain English, that means downloading a full-length HD movie in seconds. 5G will also increase total bandwidth, which we will need in order to accommodate the growing Internet of Things. We're talking about the class of devices like internet-connected refrigerators, thermostats, dog collars, but 5G will enable many, many more. Things like your utility, network, factories, where machines are just sat there, not connected at all. Suddenly, we're, they're all going to be connected. Suddenly, we're going to be able to have real-time monitoring. Other things like cars, like uh, utility poles, like your light, you know, the, the light poles. But perhaps the biggest advance will be a huge reduction in communication lag time, known as latency. A network of driverless cars will need the speed of 5G to ping each other multiple times per second to avoid collisions. Near instantaneous data transfers could allow doctors to perform surgery remotely with a robotic scalpel. So how will all this work? First, you need to improve network density. And that's just a fancy word for saying you put more towers out there. What we're being told is that's not actually the case with 5G. The idea is 5G will not only use the existing mobile spectrum, but also tap into higher frequencies called millimeter waves. Millimeter waves can carry more data, but only travel short distances. This may mean you'll see a lot more of these base stations around town. And the new towers may have as many as 100 antenna ports, compared to about a dozen on 4G cell towers. So when will we get 5G? Getting 5G ready is expected to cost providers $275 billion over seven years in the U.S. alone. Look for the first 5G service to pop up in big cities sometime in 2019. think of Vladimir Putin, they think of capital P, power. And that's exactly the impression he creates. Whether it's physical power, firing different weapons, riding in various James Bond-esque modes of transportation, or tossing hapless opponents in judo. Or political power, ruling his own country with an iron fist, crushing his political opposition, or, most recently, being accused of meddling in foreign elections for his own benefit. This is how Vladimir Putin went from a poor, tough kid in Leningrad to a KGB spy to the very symbol of modern Russia. Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin was born in 1952 in Leningrad, which is now St. Petersburg. His father was a factory foreman and his mother a homemaker. It is widely said that Putin's public-facing tough guy persona can be traced back to him getting into fights when he was younger, which paved the way for him to take up judo. After getting a law degree from Leningrad State University, Putin joined the KGB Foreign Intelligence Service. He spent 16 years in the KGB. 
When Putin returned to Russia, he began his political career. He went to work for Anatoly uh, Sobchak, who was then the mayor of St. Petersburg. That's Leonid Bershinsky. I'm a columnist at Bloomberg View. Putin thrived in Sobchak's administration because... He, he was sort of considered pretty efficient, city official at that time. He was very loyal to Sobchak. So loyal and efficient that... He was noticed by Yeltsin's close circle. And those people soon brought Putin over to Moscow to work in Yeltsin's administration, where he quickly climbed the political ladder. Then, of course, he was promoted to prime minister of Russia. That's Dmitry Trenin. I am currently director of the Carnegie Moscow Center. Around this time, Yeltsin and the people around him, the so-called family, decided that Putin would become Yeltsin's successor. And then this happened. The apartment bombings were carried out in three Russian cities, killing 293 people and injuring more than 1,000. Putin immediately accused Chechen separatists for the bombings and followed it up with action. He was credited as having a very successful military campaign against the terrorists. And it worked. After that, he became an heir apparent in the eyes of the Russian people. Three months later, Yeltsin resigned. And on his way out, a famous exchange. He was getting into the car in the Kremlin, and the last words that he addressed to Putin before getting into his car was, take good care of Russia. So Putin took over as president, and three months after that, won his first election. But just because Putin won the presidency, that didn't mean he had all the power. This is Michael McFaul. I was U.S. ambassador from 2012 to 2014. In the 1990s, there was a fire sale of all the things worth owning in Russia. The oligarchs did better than others in that fire sale, sometimes called privatization. And those people tended to be well connected with the Yeltsin regime, and they weren't Putin's friends. But they probably miscalculated, thinking that they could easily find a way to influence him. It became impossible almost from the start. From that very moment, there was warfare between him and the oligarchs. That's when Putin gave the oligarchs a choice. Putin's way. Some of those people from the 90s managed to figure out a new way of, of dealing with Putin and have survived. Or prison. Others could not find common vision, and so they lost their assets. Kodakovsky once was Russia's richest person, worth $15 billion, but he ran afoul of President Vladimir Putin and spent a decade in prison. With domestic power consolidated, Putin focused on restoring Russia's global influence. Putin is the guy who believes in the expansionist Russian state. Georgia and Ukraine and all the other Soviet republics that split off when the Soviet Union fell apart. He still believes that they're traditional Russian satellites. A lot of his strategy is about keeping them in the orbit. That yields in line, take good care of Russia. That's how he understands it. And he used annexation and as well as oil, gas, and trade to keep former Soviet republics in Russia's orbit. In 2008, Putin's two terms were up, and he decided to step down as president. Dmitry Medvedev stepped in as president, and Putin went back to prime minister. But really... Putin never left power. He pretty much continued running the country, and Medvedev was a bit of a figurehead. There was actually a period of cooperation between Russia and the U.S. that benefited both countries during Medvedev's presidency. Because Medvedev did not have the same negative attitude towards the West as Putin did. But when Putin came back to run for a third term? In the lead-up to the 2012 election, it is widely believed that both the presidential and parliamentary elections were rigged, and Russians took to the streets. Putin blamed the protests squarely on America, and more specifically, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. He believed that she had sent, and this is his words, a signal to demonstrators. Still, Putin won by a huge margin and set about crushing the protest movement immediately upon his return to the Kremlin. Over the next few years, Russia's economy tumbled. Putin annexed Crimea, leading to sanctions. The price of oil fell drastically. The ruble hit a new low. And America played down Russia's influence, with Obama calling Russia a regional power. Despite all of that, Putin approval rating remained sky high, and then an opportunity for payback. I think I'd get very, along very well with Vladimir Putin. In 2016, there was one candidate who called Vladimir Putin very smart. Trump exhibited tolerance towards Putin's actions annexing Crimea, and similar views on NATO and sanctions. Secretary Clinton didn't support any of those views.
even though Putin denies any wrongdoing, U.S. elections. Yes. The U.S. has accused Russia of being behind the leaking of 20,000 Democratic National Committee emails, which many say helped Trump beat Hillary Clinton in the presidential election. Which leaves us here with the possibility of a President Putin until 2024, positioning Russia to be the world power he always imagined it should be. is Asia's richest man and most recognizable business tycoon. He's the chairman of Alibaba, China's e-commerce giant and one of the 10 largest companies in the world, yet he still wants more. We know where we're going. We want to be the fifth largest economy. Big words from the man some call Asia's Jeff Bezos. He's confident, he's charismatic, and he's definitely not the average CEO. This is how a poor school teacher went from the classroom to being one of the most influential multi-billionaires in the world. Ma was born in China's southeastern city Hangzhou in 1964. His parents were traditional musician storytellers. As a teenager, he started to learn English from foreign tourists after China opened up in the late 1970s. And then for nine years, Jack Ma hung around outside the Hangzhou Hotel, which is now called the Shangri-La. He would get up at 5 a.m. to talk to travelers. That's Bloomberg technology reporter Lulu Chen. And I cover China internet for Bloomberg. Ma failed China's National University entrance exam twice before being admitted to local teachers' college. He graduated in 1988. He applied for 30 jobs and got rejected, including from the fast food giant KFC. When KFC came to China, come to say, <laughs> 20, 24 people went for the job. 
73 people accepted. I was the only guy. Then Mark got a job at a local university and taught English there for about five years, earning just $15 a month. On the side, he started a translation company with several friends. During a company trip to the US in 1995, Ma had his first encounter with the internet at a friend's place in Seattle. I searched the first word of beer. <laughs> I don't know why, because it's easy to spell, baby. And I see beers from Germany, beers from the USA, beers from uh, uh, Japan, but there's no beer from China. So he searched for the word China instead and still couldn't find anything. And that got him thinking. Um, he wanted to build something that would put China on the world's map. He started China Pages, a Yellow Pages-like website, but it didn't take off. Then Ma joined a government agency in Beijing to help set up a website. By 1999, the internet stock boom had gripped Wall Street, and back in his Hangzhou apartment, Ma decided to try again. With his wife and a group of friends, Ma raised $80,000 and set up Alibaba, a site that allowed businesses to sell stuff to each other. By 2000, Alibaba had raised $25 million from investors, including Goldman Sachs and SoftBank. He had no business plan and uh, zero revenue, but his eyes was very strong, strong eyes. <laughs> In 2003, Alibaba started Taobao, a platform for individual sellers to trade with each other, and publicly declared war against eBay, who had started to make a foray into China. Jack Ma has this famous saying that Alibaba is a crocodile in the Yangtze River, whereas eBay is a shark in the ocean. And if they fight eBay in the ocean, then they'll lose. But if they fight them in the Yangtze River, then they have a home base advantage. In 2007, just one year after it forced eBay out of China, Alibaba debuted its business-facing division on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange, but it delisted five years later as its performance sagged. But in 2014, Alibaba raised $25 billion in the world's biggest IPO in New York. Everybody should have a dream. What if that dream comes true? After achieving dominance in the business of e-commerce in China, Alibaba has been building an internet empire worth $472 billion with businesses in cloud computing, online video streaming, movie production, healthcare, sports, retail, and even news media. Alibaba buying into South China Morning Post really raised eyebrows. This is the largest English newspaper in Hong Kong, and it shows that Jack Ma's ambitions weren't limited to e-commerce. He wanted to influence not just Chinese users, but also overseas users as well. The US has criticized Alibaba for allowing companies to sell counterfeit and poorly made goods. But in China, it enjoys the favor of China's government. It's part of Ma's company philosophy. Being in love with the government, but don't marry with them. Jack Ma is an extremely fortunate man for jumping on the internet sector so early. Note that this is a person who has no coding skills at all. He's a natural showman and a gifted public speaker and really able to convince others to believe in his vision. Ma's vision of growing Alibaba to be the world's fifth largest economy faces strong competition at home and abroad. It will require more than just naked ambition and charisma, but Ma is great at getting himself in the right place at the right time. So far, it's served him well.
Peter Thiel is a walking contradiction. He got his bachelor's and juris doctorate from Stanford, but speaks out about the horrors of higher education, saying colleges... As corrupt as the Catholic Church was 500 years ago. He's a staunch supporter of the free press, yet he bankrolled a lawsuit to bankrupt an independent media company. But these were not, these were not journalists. Girl. Most of all, he's an immigrant libertarian who's the most public supporter of Donald Trump in all of Silicon Valley. What Trump represents isn't crazy, and it's not going away. This is the story of how an openly gay, immigrant genius, libertarian billionaire went from tech contrarian to Silicon Valley's biggest Trump supporter. Peter Thiel was born on October 11, 1967 in Frankfurt, West Germany, to Suzanne and Klaus Thiel. Peter's family emigrated to Cleveland, Ohio when he was one. An Ayn Rand devotee during his youth, Thiel attended Stanford University majoring in philosophy. His Stanford experience shaped a really big part of who he decided to surround himself with. That's Lizette Chapman. And I cover technology and venture capital here at Bloomberg. He and his Stanford friends made their first big splash in tech with PayPal. After selling to eBay for $1.5 billion, they would become known as the PayPal Mafia for each incredible success after PayPal. For Teal, that began with an early, modest $500,000 investment in Facebook. And in VC speak, early means big risk, but also big reward. He turned that initial $500,000 investment into more than $1 billion in cash. But Teal was just getting started with Facebook, and he went on to make a whole bunch of wildly successful investments. From SpaceX to Airbnb to one of the largest, most powerful companies in the United States, not the world, and of course that's Palantir. The incredibly controversial secret of data mining startup he founded with his colleagues from PayPal. It connects data silos and then allows non-technical people to search that information for patterns. Data like financial information, feeds from video cameras, biometric details, passport information, flight manifest. Palantir doesn't talk much about how they collect this data, who has access to it, or what they do with it. But they have contracts with the Department of Homeland Security and the CIA and the Department of Justice and the Securities and Exchange Commission and several other federal agencies. It's the richest company you've never heard of, valued at $20 billion. But there are plenty of obscenely wealthy people in Silicon Valley. What makes him different... He's a complex ball of multiple contradictions. Take college, for example. Even though college was extremely important for Teal, there's something called the Teal Fellowship. In exchange for dropping out and a promise not to pursue college, Teal would give them $100,000 each. You basically tell people that uh, if you get a diploma, you're saved. You know, otherwise you go to hell. You know, you go to Yale or you go to jail. Also, his relationship with the press. Here's another contradiction. He's donated to free press initiatives, including the Committee to Protect Journalists. But he also secretly spent tens of millions of dollars bankrolling a lawsuit filed by Hulk Hogan over the publication of a sex tape and bankrupting the independently run Gawker Media. Why did he do this? Because in 2007, one of Gawker Media's blogs, Valleywag, outed him as gay. And with the lawsuit, he found an opportunity to get back at them by funding the lawsuit that Hulk Hogan was able to bring then, but he wouldn't have been able to do that without Teal's money. And finally, Teal's biggest contradiction, his endorsement of Donald Trump. When he was asked about his support for Trump, he was surprised at the outrage that came with it for many of his colleagues in, in Silicon Valley. He didn't want more of the establishment. No matter how crazy this election seems, it is less crazy than the condition of our country. After briefly supporting Carly Fiorina in the primaries, Teal pivoted to Trump, donating $1.25 million to Trump and his associated super PACs in October 2016. And he didn't just help Trump financially. He gave a full-throated keynote speech supporting Trump at the Republican National Convention. I'm not a politician, but neither is Donald Trump. He is a builder, and it's time to rebuild America. And when Trump was finally elected, Teal was given the reins to an enormous amount of power. And I want to thank you, man. You have a very special guy. He was named the transitional advisor. And in that role, he did a lot of interviewing and a lot of vetting to fill hundreds of cabinet positions 
and different jobs within the administration. But it turns out, Teal's support isn't unconditional. Talking to people who spend time with him, I have also heard that he is no longer a great supporter of Trump. It was reported that Teal was unhappy with the direction of Trump's presidency. Ever since, he's been mum, making no public appearances, no statements, and staying out of the spotlight altogether. Although there have been suggestions that Trump could tap Teal for a top intelligence post or ambassadorship, there's no indication he'd accept. He's described his relationship with politics as schizophrenic. He gets really involved, and then he runs away as fast as possible. Whether Teal takes a new position or simply continues as a board director at Facebook and Palantir, at just 50 years old, he's primed to wield some serious influence in technology and politics for decades to come. was again the hottest year on record, and the previous 17 years have seen our 16 most scorching. Scientists overwhelmingly agree, global warming is the culprit. And it's just getting started. Ice caps, extreme weather, wildfires, droughts, and the hits keep coming. What are we doing about it? In 2015, the world took its boldest step yet to stem climate change with a historic accord in Paris. But now comes the hard part, Nations must change energy policies and invest huge amounts of money, and they will likely do it without the United States. President Donald Trump announced on June 1st that the U.S. would withdraw from the accord. The reality is that withdrawing is in America's economic interest and won't matter much to the climate. Here's the situation. Decades in the making, the Paris Agreement united the U.S., China, and more than 190 other nations in a push to limit fossil fuel pollution. 
The UN-sponsored plan secured pledges to cut greenhouse gases, the emissions that trap heat in the Earth's atmosphere, in an effort to avoid the rising seas and other environmental disasters that climate models predict. But even if all pledges are met, the globe is expected to warm by as much as 3.4 degrees Celsius this century, more than the UN target of well below 2 degrees. Meeting the Paris Agreement means that governments will have to offer more incentives for clean energy, scale back support for fossil fuels, make emissions more costly, and reduce deforestation. It's estimated that the deal will require $13.5 trillion of spending through 2030. Here's the argument. Unlike past climate pacts such as the Kyoto Protocol, each country set its own Paris targets and then promised to revisit and improve them. The U.S. was primed to play a lead role in climate change, but Trump's energy independence executive order reverses Obama-era rules and directives put in place to combat climate change and expands production of coal, the dirtiest fossil fuel. The resulting policies threaten the global fight against climate change. Without the U.S. commitment to emissions reduction, other countries may join it in abandoning the Paris Agreement. This could make it almost impossible and even more expensive down the line to stop climate change. Optimists argue that the shift to a lower carbon future is already underway. Businesses, cities, and U.S. states, such as California, are already investing in wind and solar and taking other steps to make it work. I've actually been called an environmentalist, if you can believe that. an inherent attraction to light and being human. And I think on a very deep psychological level, light is this way in which we experience the energy surrounding us in a very personal manner. My name is Matt Dilling. I'm the founder of Lightbright Neon Studio, and we manufacture, produce, and restore neon works of art and design.
origins of the creative content of a lot of the work at Lightbright comes from a variety of sources. Sometimes people come with a napkin sketch, some people come with an Adobe Illustrator file, and we have a whole design team who then we kind of work together to help create layouts of what it might look like. Scale it up and create a paper template using a pen plotter. And that paper template actually becomes our guide for what we're going to bend the neon to. We take from the office into the glass shop. We pick out the right size tubing with the right color for the right size project. From there, we heat up the glass tubing. The torches heat the glass well in excess of a thousand degrees in order for it to get into its molten state. We heat up and bend the glass tubing to match the template. One of our chandeliers has over a hundred different bends in it. So each one of those bends has to be marked for a heated up bend. We also have to allow the glass to cool between the bends so that the next area can be worked on and heated up in its own unique fashion turns into spaghetti, and then we have to make sure that that spaghetti lines back up and cools to the template. We use a blow hose to connect our mouth to the tube, create a volume that's closed, and we can control the pressure in there with our mouth. There's just a variety of challenges that come up inherently in working with glass. Glass can crack due to stress. And sometimes you'll just have a batch that all it wants to do when it gets near a torch is crap. After we've bent various components, we have to go in using the crossfire or the hand torch and actually weld all of those pieces together. The last step on that is then to weld on electrodes onto either end. Each one of those steps is very, very specific. I draw inspiration from so many different experiences. It's hard to come up with one thing that's particular, but one of the ways that I really am able to connect with the creative is to float. Floating is a similar experience to meditation, to psychedelics, going into a blackened room and laying out in a body of water and salt that's heated to your body temperature and it allows for all sort of external stimulation to fall away. And your internal world really begins to bubble up and manifest. You really get to experience a different relationship to your mind. with neon because I can't not work with it. It's so challenging and so rewarding. And those things are so intertwined that there's no way of separating it out. I've learned so much and continue to learn so much by working with it. I find so much inspiration in working with it. And I just continue to experience new and different things through the medium. It's that close to me at this point. Once the neon tube is completed, we have to hook it up to our manifold for bombarding. The manifold is open, a vacuum is drawn. We check the tube for leaks with our Tesla coil. We close the tube back off and we heat it up using a very large and powerful transformer. As the tube is heated up, it releases anything that's not inert inside the tube and we evacuate that out. We introduce the gas into it and we seal the tube off, sealing into that tube whatever gas we introduced into it. I think my favorite part of making a neon light is when I see it lit up for the first time. Different gases, when electrified, emit different wavelengths of light. Neon gas is this very bright orange, fiery red color. Argon gas creates a very intense blue, but that light output that is produced can then be expressed in a different wavelength by coating the inside of the tubes with a phosphor coating that takes that one wavelength of light and emits a different wavelength. We 
bring it over to the aging table where we hook it up to an aging transformer and allow it to settle, age the gas in that we've introduced to it. There's always a stray particle of something left inside the tube. But that time that the oxide coating can act to scrub whatever is left inside the tube while things are getting settled into place. Once the tubes are aged in, we move on to our process of assembling two halves of the fixture together in a jig, gluing up the center of the fixture to its spindle. Once the adhesive dried, we would connect the wires from the fixture together into a transformer, and we turn on power and it lights up. Part of what we love about what we do here is that we try and put out into the world the kind of things that we'd like to see. I still am surprised when it lights up. I'm still excited when I get to see it illuminated. There's an ineffable quality to it. To me, is this insight into the inner workings of the universe. It literally is. It's a way of looking at what is surrounding us in the cosmos in a new light. like an addiction. You've got to make something. You have to do something. It's borderline obsession. And every bike we build is my favourite bike at the time. And as soon as it's done, I want to build another one. It's 
defend cycles is something I've been thinking about ever since I started cycling in my late teens. We want bikes that ultimately you'll really enjoy riding. There's never a bike that's the same. There's always a slight change. And as we build them individually as well, they have the marks of a bike that's built by hand. Most people I know cycle have an idea of their dream bicycle. And it may be an evolving idea you've had in your head. And we've worked with a lot of people that have come to us with sketches and scrapbooks. It's really, really nice to build something that's just one-off and unique. I think a lot of people see a bicycle as two wheels and a frame in the middle. There are a lot of subtle changes and nuances in design that which can change the riding characteristics quite dramatically. I'm a really big fan of modernist architecture and the simplicity of a modernist building is really hard to achieve. And with some of our bikes, they may look very simple, but I think people should not underestimate the time and effort that goes into designing a product. Tubing is key to a bike's feel and ride. Reynolds tubing has been in my life ever since I can remember. Growing up, I could never afford a frame manufactured with their tubing. We can now put a badge on our bike saying manufacture of Reynolds, which is a sort of thing as a kid I just wouldn't have believed was gonna happen. Every part of the bike has a specific tube. It's not universal. The first thing we do is get the tubes out, check they're correct, check the wall thicknesses, sand the edges, make sure it's all really clean, because if it's not clean, the tubes won't join together correctly. We build in steel because I still believe it's one of the best materials to use. It's been used in bikes since the late 1800s, and they're still using it now for a very good reason. It's the flexibility that we can replace the tube, repaint the bike, and you wouldn't know it's damaged. I just like working with it, it's very sculptural. This isn't sort of aerospace precision engineering. It's a steel rule and a marker. So when we're cutting the tubes, it's within a mill or two. But what we're trying to do is take the best from bicycle building in the past and add a little bit of modern flair to it. There's various techniques for building bicycles. We do a thing called fillet brazing, where you connect a pipe together. We use a bronze rod and a flame. We heat the tubes up to the same temperature and we fill the joint with bronze. And it gives a very, very sort of fluid, lovely, sort of quite sculptural feel. It's got to practice. You've got to be able to judge material temperatures. You've got to just look at it and you just get a feel for it. It's a stage where your tubes start to look a bit like a bicycle. My father's a jeweler. He'd make sort of very pretty things which are lovely, but for me, they don't really have any function. What I love about bicycles, you can start on a Monday with a box of tubes, you can be riding it by the weekend, and it can last you for the rest of your life. Outside of the frame of forks, the other most important part is the wheels and tyres. When you build the wheels, you have to lace them, so there's little holes going all the way around the rim. You poke the spoke through. We do build all our wheels by hand here because a machine can't get 30 years worth of wheel building experience. Colour is very, very personal. With any of our bikes, you can have them painted whatever colour you want. We've matched one to the teapot so we can get that scanned and we can match that or someone's favourite item of clothing. I like to let the bike sit for four or five days minimum just so the paint can have time to cure a little bit, and then we assemble it. We get out all the new components, and it's a case of putting them together. Some bikes you can assemble in three hours, some will take three days. And we've built bikes that cost in the £10,000-plus mark. Some people, they're saving up, and this is their bike, and they're going to own it for the rest of their lives, so we just want to make sure they get the right thing. bike for me was the first time I had some freedom so as soon as I had one I was off. A lot of people still get that thrill as when they were a kid blasting down a hill wind going through their hair it's fun everyone has their favorite jacket or something it just makes them feel good if you've got a bike that fits well you actually feel part of it. Building bicycles as a creative outlet is fantastic.
it's not something you do because you're going to get a big paycheck at the end of the day. You do it something you have a passion for it. If you ever saw a wooden surfboard, it was probably hanging in somebody's house or underneath the deck. But kind of in the last 10 or 15 years, wood has made a big comeback. They surf wonderfully. It's beautiful and it feels great to be on one of them. I always had a love for wood and kind of passionate about things that went in the water. I've kind of been around wooden boats most of my life. There's just so much character. The way they're built, the stories that come with them, a lot of that has translated over to why we build surfboards the way we do. When we first started thinking about building surfboards, wood was the natural material we chose. They have a very high strength to weight ratio. Wooden surfboards have the longest history of use in the surf world than any other material. People have been surfing wooden surfboards since kind of the first documented history of people riding waves. The board starts in CAD, where we take a 3D model, break down the shape and kind of create frames and templates and all the inner parts of the board that we get cut on a CNC. We take those frames and we just pop them out, assemble the frame into kind of a skeleton. go out to our lumber shed, pick a bunch of cedar, and bring them into our mill shop, put glue along the edges, clamp it all together into a panel. Everything's book matched. You have symmetry in the colors and texture of the wood. Cut your outline. 
take our assembled frame, gently put it down right on top of the plank. Once that foundation is started, you're basically building up the three-dimensional shape, the outside part of the board, using lots of strips that kind of interlock and fit together. Every piece of wood is going to be different, and it's all going to react differently. There are frustrations with it, but I think that's one of the things that keeps it challenging. You learn to read the kind of what the grain lines are doing and what the color of the wood is telling you. Once those rails are cleaned up, we put our top planks on. It's a little bit like putting a lid on a box. It's like, this is it. Whatever's inside that board is staying inside that board. And by tensioning some rope, you can clamp the two together. It's like a time capsule. What makes our boards unique are they are built right here in York. They're built using material that grows right here in the state of Maine. They're built 100% by hand by local craftspeople and surfers. There is a lot of time that goes into these boards, between 40 and 60 hours start to finish. We wanted to build surfboards that were as hollow as they could be, but still be strong enough to work well. Too light and they don't surf well, but too heavy and they don't surf well. So there's a, there's a balance point there and that's where we try to be. Taking the board off the rocker table once the top has gone on, that is by far one of my top favorite parts. It's just you and a shaping stand, a board, and a hand plane. Everything else is out of your view. It's simple, it's pleasurable, it's quiet. You can be with your thoughts and you can just kind of be present. There's something about taking a nice sharp edge tool to a beautiful piece of wood and feeling the curls coming off and knowing that every pass that you're making, you're kind of getting it closer and closer to what you have in mind. Once we've shaped it down and the board's looking like it's supposed to look like, time for it to go into the glassing room. Four ounce fiberglass, laying it over the board, draping it over the edges, cutting it, applying epoxy, and on the board. Once both sides are lamb coated, it's time to put in the hardware. Drill and router and install the fin box. And on the other side, we drill and put in the leash plug and a vent. There's a lot of air just naturally inside the board, and that air wants to expand and contract with temperature changes. And that vent has a little piece of Gore-Tex fabric in it, and it allows air to kind of breathe both ways, but it doesn't allow water to get in. Once all that hardware is put in, goes back into the glassing room. We brush a nice, beautiful, thick coat of epoxy over the whole surface, and that we call a gloss coat. That's supposed to look beautiful and glossy and shiny and flawless. You get to see that board come to life. Whatever the colors in the wood, they really come out. It just makes it look like candy. You just want to touch it and run your hands down it, and it's just kind of the icing on the cake. everything is hard, we put it into what we call the oven, get that epoxy to cure, really kind of bake it, and just get it to harden. Put in the fin, screw in the vent, and ship it out. We just love the idea of building something that's sustainable and long-lasting and made by hand. Kind of gives you a deeper connection to the product over something you might buy on a shelf. When a customer gets the board, they feel it. They 100% feel the amount of work and the amount of passion that went into the board. So I'm not really looking at hours and efficiency. We're looking at like doing it right and uh, enjoying it as we go.
Ma Baoli, better known as Gang La, is one of the four Grand Marshals leading New York's Pride Parade this year. But in the country he comes from, being gay is still a social taboo. The CEO of a Beijing-based internet company is on a mission to improve the lives of millions of gay men in China. Mars company Blue City runs an app and a website specifically for gay men. Blue is one of the biggest gay social networking apps in the world, with an estimated 30 million registered users. Unlike most other apps, Blue is more than just dating or hookups. Back in 2000, when Ma studied at a police school in northern China, he realized he didn't feel like everyone else. After visiting some foreign websites with different attitudes to homosexuality, Ma created his own site for a Chinese audience, encouraging people that... Even though attitudes towards homosexuals are slowly changing in China, it's still a social stigma. The virtual world of Blued, where members can be open about their sexuality, is for most a striking contrast to their real lives. This is live streaming, a function added to Blued in late 2015, right as the internet craze was starting to take off in China. Many self-made stars like Jin make decent amounts of money by receiving audiences' virtual currencies and gifts. <coughs> Kyle and Klaus, a couple who have come out, live streaming on Blued means something different. The government's rules for acceptable content online may shift quickly in China, with LGBT material in a gray area. Many companies feel the chill of the recent internet crackdown, but Blue City still runs as usual. Ma has won the Chinese government's trust by helping with HIV prevention among gay men. A third of the company's staff are dedicated to screening pornographic and politically sensitive content. In the past five years, Blue City has grown from a team of seven people to a promising business of about 250 staff. Ma said the company earned over 15 million US dollars last year, mainly through advertising and selling virtual currencies to live streaming audiences. Now the company is expanding overseas.
This is Rich Jiga. He's a Chinese rapper by way of Indonesia, and he's very popular on the internet. This is Joji. He's a Japanese-Australian singer, and he's also very popular on the internet. Plus, Joji invented the Harlem Shake meme. Let me say that again. This guy, Joji, in the blood bathtub, invented the Harlem Shake meme. But we'll come back to that. So Rich and Joji are both signed to 88 Rising, an entertainment company hoping to build a lasting global brand that will outlive singular moments of virality. They primarily create content combining Asian culture and hip hop, a formula that apparently pleases the internet gods greatly. They've only been around for 18 months, but they're already putting up major label numbers. I think that we have an unprecedented collective of talent, a group of like predominantly Asian artists, you know, really like making waves globally, which um, from an independent point of view as well. 88's founder, Sean Miyashiro, cut his teeth launching Vice's electronic music channel, Thump. But quickly, Sean became interested in life beyond dance music. I knew that after launching a whole content platform that I have kind of the ability and the know-how to, to, to do it again, but like for what was the question. So Sean moved to the Bronx to start over and figure it out. He couldn't afford an office space, so he worked out of his car at the top of a grimy parking garage. Everything kind of started here. If you look around, this is my environment. This is my, this is my serenity, really, really. 88 Rising was built here. Built on the grounds of uh, LA Fitness residence uh, in a parking garage. I was living in the Bronx. I'm just like, damn, where the hell do I go? So I just come up here and I like, you know, I just kind of figure things out every single day. Being like, okay, what the hell is this thing? <laughs> Coming here was kind of like my own kind of private office, basically. Like, to be honest, I would even go to the bathroom here. I would like take pisses here, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, it was, you know, it's was, it was just too far to go back down there. When I need Wi-Fi, I'd spend a good part of the day at Dunkin' Donuts. Hi, how are you? Can I get a, a chicken snack wrap? Before 88 Rising officially launched, Sean caught a surprise break in the form of a Twitter friendship with a funny 16-year-old kid from Indonesia named Brian, who taught himself English by watching Rubik's Cube tutorial videos on YouTube. Seriously, that's true. I thought his Twitter was genius from the future, just crazy. And like, just the shit that he was saying, like the memes he was making. But I didn't know that he rapped or anything like that. I really didn't, and uh, he came up with that sick like two weeks later. That stick was Brian's first ever attempt at making a rap song, and it immediately went viral. Everything was great about it. But the one thing that I noticed is the song was hard as hell. Just like everything about it, man. Just like, um, it was menacing, bro. Soon after the video dropped, Brian signed with 88 Rising. I'll FaceTime with Rich. Sorry for calling you Rich Shiga on my phone, Rich. He gets, I mean, Brian, he gets like super pissed off that he saved in my phone as Rich Shiga. He's like, dude, am I not, am I not a human to you? What's good, bro? What's good, brother? How you doing? I'm doing great. Let's do the How was it? It was tight. So, Brian could definitely rap, but some viewers understandably took offense at a Chinese kid satirizing rap cliches and calling himself Rich Chiga. But if a group of well known rappers saw the video and genuinely liked it, that could at least help validate Brian as a legit hip-hop artist. Plus, it could be really funny. It was just kind of an idea that kind of I, I just had on the spot. Everything that rappers say is better and funnier and smarter and wittier. You know, it's just more entertaining. We just edit it as tight as possible, put it up, and uh, 
It really works. <laughs> Yo, this nigga got a pouch on and a rebound pouch. This is the hardest nigga of all time. You said when you come for a chicken like me. <laughs> that was dope. Like, it's just lit, and I think people would take it as a people would take it as a joke at first, but it's like if he ran with that and kept doing more videos like that, it's just lit. You know, I I've never been to America before and like all of a sudden it's like I see like all the rappers that I listen to just like reacting to my stuff and I was like, What? How did this happen? The reaction video also went viral and even led to a remix of that stick featuring Wu-Tang's Ghostface. I'll get on that track. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> really? On the remix? Yeah, yeah. Oh, you got Oh, you know him? And yeah, the remix went viral too. Brian has since acknowledged the misstep in his name and claims he may change it. But for the time being, he's still Rich Chiga to his fans. An ever-growing global audience, hungry for more releases from emerging talent around the world. I didn't know that it was gonna gonna be this impactful and this important to people, and I'm I'm very thankful and blessed that it has. And every day now that you know I wake up, it's it's like you know it's just like a new mission every day. A major part of that mission involves Joji. Remember the bloody bath guy? He's a former YouTube personality in the middle of a career transition. The sound of, of this, this song, Will He, is it's like a trap song that you can like slow dance to. Awkward prom shit, you know what I mean? I used to do crazy uh, episodic uh, internet videos. It was going well, and one day, it was me, it was me and a, a few friends just in a room. We were, we were casually chilling, and then someone plays the song, and it's, it's brand new. I happen to have a lot of costumes laying around, so I told the other guys, I was like, get in these costumes and let's just dance to it. Like, who cares? We were like, okay, let's let's just go crazy at the drop. So that video goes up, I go to sleep, and the next morning, everyone's doing it. Like, next morning. That taught me a lot about the internet, how People want to just be a part of something. And from that point on, something changed, and I was a little better at understanding demographics and people and, you know, what they want to see and what they want to hear. I was friends with uh, a couple other artists who were affiliated with 88, and then I also started to realize that 88 is, is the, the bridge uh, between Western and, and, and Asian entertainment. And I really wanted to be a part of that. Joji just released the In Tongues EP, his first project as a serious artist. Joji's In Tongues record came out a couple weeks ago. Um, it's number two on Billboard on the R&B charts, which is crazy for you know independent release. And he's like a brand new artist. And the success is even more impressive, knowing he went from creating something like this. It's just Taco Bell. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> To creating something like this, the newest music video for his song Demons. Tonight, Rich Chiga has a show in New York City. Tickets sold out. In an hour. I came here. I'm first on line. I, I came here at one. Yeah, I was, I was the third person on line. So why would you get here so early? Because I'm going to see Rich Chica. I want to touch him. <laughs> <laughs> what do you guys think of Joji? Oh, oh my god! god. <laughs> 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 that's not that. Yeah, yeah. You guys cop the new EP or like? Yeah. 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 I woke up at six in the morning just to cop this shit, and then I listened to it. And I just thought it made me cry. <laughs> this is actually kind of exciting. Every time, this never gets old. Like, you live online and social media, but like, there's nothing like just being with the people.
More often than not, viral success happens by accident. And then after an appearance on Ellen or Jimmy Kimmel, the creator's star power fizzles out. But Idiot Rising has figured out how to turn potential gimmicks into brands with an actual following that keeps coming back for the next thing. Oh, shit! (laughs) So keep an eye out for Idiot's next move. But more than likely, it won't be covered on network television or terrestrial radio. Although, as they've already proven, nowadays that really doesn't matter. Retailer Farfetch is betting it can shape the future. This is its concept store showcasing the latest in retail tech. How do you capture all of that fantastic information that you gather in store with customers, touch and feel products? And we created a concept called the Connected Rail. And this is using a combination of RFID and ultrasound. The RFID signal uh, recognizes the product and the ultrasound recognizes the movement. Take the product off and then you'll start to see your products appear. And essentially it's like online browsing behavior. Whichever products you touch and pick up in the store are automatically sent to your app. This is effectively what you've created is your in-store wish list. In the middle you'll see essentially a hologram of the product. What the customer sees, they they control the experience on um, a touch device. What this allows the customer to do is take uh, elements of products and then add their own style to it. Um, 
Right, so this is the connected mirror. So in this example, I see my products. I select a coat, and that's tried it, and it's slightly too big for me. So what I can do is choose an alternative size and send a request to the sales associate, and they'll bring that size to me in the fitting room mirror. You'll also see that we've got some product recommendations here. Crucially, the sales associate's able to push items into the mirror from their device. If you wanted to, you could simply use the mirror and pay and go. Your items would then be packed and dispatched to you afterwards. Do you want me to turn you so you're looking outwards? Yes, please. Yes, please? How about there? First time we came out with B, Jade said, it feels like I've been released from prison. Do you want these, Mrs? Yes, definitely. Definitely. <laughs> right. Yeah. And she could say hello to everybody, people she hadn't seen for months. It's Jade. Hey, it's Jade. So you can talk to Jade through this. Hi, Katie. She's there. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Every time anyone's seen her, they want to know why she's there. And it's kind of the opposite of when you're in a wheelchair and people see you and they kind of go, oh, um, should I look? I don't know. I don't know what the right protocol is. When there's a tiny robot with its bright little eyes going around just looking happy everywhere, um, it really opens you up for conversation. We've got some friends here, look. <laughs> Hiya. When I saw her for the first time, I remember thinking, this is gonna change things. This is one of those points where if this was a book, this would be the cliffhanger. I have a 
condition called Ellers Danlos syndrome, um, which means that I have a lot of dislocations, there's a lot of pain, um, and a lot of seizures and whatnot. So I can end up um, on my own in my room uh, for long periods of time. A lot of the time, um, with a condition like my own, of course there's the pain, and the pain is bad, and the dislocations are bad, and the seizures, and being in paralysis, and never knowing whether you're going to be able to wake up properly tomorrow, that's bad. But what's worse still is being able to count the number of people you see a day on one hand. Are you ready? Sure am, I'm just hoping the connection's going to stay. Yeah, me too. Alright, here we go. When you're used to just the same little metre by metre and a half window every day, and you've been there for months, being able to just see the sky from somewhere else, or the tops of trees, or a sign, is incredible. Or being able to have that kind of chat in the car that most people will probably take for granted. I'm going to go past Grandma and Grandad so you can give them a wave. Now, if Jade was particularly seizure she um, can still take part. Um, and that's brilliant, really, because before she would just be left um, in, in a bed or in the house with just her carers. It's quite a small world, that. Right, so there's one of them. Uh, here, this, this costume I'm busy making at the moment. When I'm not on bed rest and I'm not just um, wearing pyjamas all the time, um, I enjoy uh, being able to dress as different characters and go to comic cons and that kind of thing um, because it just lets me show a different side of myself um, and it's a, it's a bit of fun. If you can't go out that often, you've got to enjoy it when you do. <laughs> What's that? Oh, that's good. <laughs> it's one of those weird things where I want to not have to use B because I want to be well enough to be able to go to those places myself. Like, it really makes a big difference to me to be able to go into school. But the thing is, with my condition fluctuating all of the time, I can't go into school reliably. still a few little things that we need to work out but for the most part I think it's going fairly well um, and it's brilliant because I can really tell the difference between today and yesterday um, how yesterday I forced myself to go into school when I wasn't very well and I was really tired afterwards and ended up having loads of seizures whereas today I've been able to do all of the work I've been able to keep a clear head and not be ill which means I'm able to be more focused on my schoolwork so there is my first step of working, is to simplify route eight. The algebra test is next week. Now I'm trying to make friendships, which I'll be able to maintain with B. Before that, I end up letting people down quite often. B gives me hope, yeah, she's just always there. And if I can't do something, she can't. And if I need sort of assistance to be able to make commitments, then she's there and she means that I feel like a more valuable person because I'm more reliable.
it debuted, the 4G wireless we have today allowed people for the first time to hit the road and explore unknown places with only a smartphone for directions. When 5G arrives, it could enable driverless cars to take us there as well. 5G stands for 5th Generation Mobile Networks or Wireless Systems. It's insanely fast and can accommodate a lot more connected devices. But the reason it's being called revolutionary is because 5G will allow connected devices to speak to each other as well as people. Right now we're living in a world where really it's, it's a one-way experience. That's Bloomberg tech reporter Ian King. The network talks to your phone, you look at your phone and access data, then you send something back to the network. What we're being told about 5G is that really for the first time we're going to see machines communicating with each other over mobile networks in a meaningful way. 5G could end up being 100 times faster than what we have now, with speeds that could reach 20 gigabits per second. In plain English, that means downloading a full-length HD movie in seconds. 5G will also increase total bandwidth, which we will need in order to accommodate the growing Internet of Things. We're talking about the class of devices like internet-connected refrigerators, thermostats, dog collars, but 5G will enable many, many more. Things like your utility, network, factories, where machines are just sat there, not connected at all. Suddenly, we're, they're all going to be connected. Suddenly, we're going to be able to have real-time monitoring. Other things like cars, like uh, utility poles, like your light, you know, the, the light poles. But perhaps the biggest advance will be a huge reduction in communication lag time, known as latency. A network of driverless cars will need the speed of 5G to ping each other multiple times per second to avoid collisions. Near instantaneous data transfers could allow doctors to perform surgery remotely with a robotic scalpel. So how will all this work? First, you need to improve network density. And that's just a fancy word for saying you put more towers out there. What we're being told is that's not actually the case with 5G. The idea is 5G will not only use the existing mobile spectrum, but also tap into higher frequencies called millimeter waves. Millimeter waves can carry more data, but only travel short distances. This may mean you'll see a lot more of these base stations around town. And the new towers may have as many as 100 antenna ports compared to about a dozen on 4G cell towers. So when will we get 5G? Getting 5G ready is expected to cost providers $275 billion over seven years in the U.S. alone. Look for the first 5G service to pop up in big cities sometime in 2019.
The cubicle represents a tyranny that it confines your imagination, your thoughts into a small physical area. Imagine pretty much every software engineer or finance person being able to you know, disconnect from their desk and look at holographic monitors on a beach and doing their work from there. That's not going to be science fiction. It's the modern office place. Silicon Valley is all about building the future. A startup called Meta thinks it's getting there first, thanks to a big bet that it's made on augmented reality. How are you? Good, thank you. Welcome to Meta. Thank you. Call it a 360-degree office where you can spatialize your thoughts as part of your workflow for education, architecture, design, engineering, etc. People often mix up augmented reality with virtual reality. VR totally blocks your ability to see or hear the real world. AR overlays holograms onto what you already see. Meta has tried to make its version of the workspace feel familiar. You grab the hologram instead of using a controller or a mouse, and your brain already knows how to do it. In other words, we've designed an operating system that humanity has always known how to use. So you can see this eyeball, which is, by the way, photorealistic. You can see my hand is occluding the eyeball, and now the eyeball is occluding my hand, right? You see those two circles? They get small, and then they turn into this glowing white ball, and then I can move my hand around supernaturally. I can do this with two hands and rotate the thing. I can stretch it. I can throw it back right into the shelving system, and that's all you have to learn to become a modern worker. And to prove this, the employees at Meta have started to get rid of their computer monitors, trading them in for Meta's augmented reality headsets. Miron thinks that in less than a decade, we'll all be just wearing strips of glass that can project holograms. In the early 80s, everybody had computers on their desktop, but no one was using them because they had a lot of work to do. So they were still using typewriters. And at some point, the CEO took all the typewriters away and everybody was forced to use their computers. So it's very exciting to see a new generation of technology, a new paradigm. I consider us like pioneers in the holographic wild. I'm pulling up my browser with my hands and sending out emails to colleagues and just kind of really acclimating to the new environment. putting on my computer, essentially. Our digital lives live on our phones. We have all of our pictures and notes and all these kinds of things. So and why don't you write yourself a little sticky note? I like it. And go ahead and just take your fist right over the top of the sticky note and close your fist. And now. Oh, what? Meta's own transition to augmented reality has run into plenty of unexpected problems. And it's still going to be a while before you'll start to see these devices in your office. But I think it's a future worth waiting for. If we could see these holograms between us, we will have been able to share our work with one another more naturally, more efficiently, and more productively than ever before. Humanity will have evolved slightly.
This is Hatsune Miku, Japan's sensational virtual pop star. She's released over 100,000 songs in multiple languages and performed sold out concerts around the world. Her image has appeared in games, on TV, in car races, and is even etched on the side of a Japanese space rocket. I came for Hatsune Miku, Carlos. She's Lady Gaga's favorite digital pop star and opened shows for her in the US three years ago. Tens of thousands of fans attended her exhibition and live shows near Tokyo recently. She's everything to everybody. That's probably why she's so popular. Miku's creator, Hiroyuki Ito, and his Sapporo based company have been developing the virtual diva for over 10 years. Both the software and character are named Hatsune Miku, meaning the first sound of the future. Originally based on Yamaha's Vocaloid technology, Miku the software has a sound bank containing voice samples and a huge array of tools. You input the melody and lyrics, then Miku the character sings them. To date, Krypton has sold 120,000 software licenses at $200 each to fans around the world who use it to create numerous songs and share them online. Some of the fan-created songs are chosen to be part of Miku's concerts, for which they're paid a royalty fee. <laughs> also has other revenue streams. It makes money from merchandising, licensing deals, and concert ticket sales. According to the real-life musicians who perform with Hatsune Miku, the virtual pop star is interesting and surprising. For Ito, Miku has the potential to change the way we think about music. For her fans, it goes even further.
Now, there are a lot of fitness gadgets out there. In my quest to get fit, I tested 17 of them over the last few months. At least one personal trainer I know was a little bit skeptical. Yeah, I've been watching these new technologies come to the market for almost as long as I've been a personal trainer. They're just tricks and tropes. They're not much different than the Bowflex machine or, to be honest, the original Jane Fonda workout video. But some of these gadgets that are just coming to the market do so much more than what they used to do, just tracking your activities. Out of all of them, this chest strap was my favorite. It comes with a robot coach that points to the future, one where you might not need a human trainer at all. And it works like this. You wear the chest strap so that it can read your heart rate, and that connects to Move's free app that talks to you. Welcome to Move Heart Rate Hit Outdoor Running. Let's get moving and warm up in zone two. Move's computerized coach tells you what to do at that exact moment, whether you're running outside or you're doing body weight exercises indoors. Swing your arms faster to get your legs moving quicker. Let's crush this round. And by reading your heart rate, she knows exactly how hard you're working. She keeps you honest. Way to go, you are in the target zone. Keep pushing, you're almost at the end of the round. Don't give up. I've been running for seven years now, and my biggest problem is that I never push myself hard enough. I end up going on the same slow, comfortable 30-minute jog, but the Move HR burn blasted me out of that rut. By the end of these half-hour exercises, I was drenched in sweat in a way that I never am when I work out alone. Training with a real person is great, whether that's your group instructor or your coach or your personal trainer, but humans, they're expensive. For the rest of us, this $60 gadget is all you need.
what does it take to okay ladies and gentlemen i am going to place an order to sell short british pound the price i'm looking to sell 138.88 okay so the price i'm looking to sell at 138.88 Okay, so if you're looking to sell short, you still have a chance because it moved up. So you can play, you can place an order, or you can sell at the at the price right now. You can see on the screen. I don't advise. Usually, I like to place an order because we sometimes hold positions, many positions, and we open positions at the other level. So just if you will keep it as the hobby not to place market order not to pl uh, buy at market price but to place an order you will always do this kind of things anyway position opened at 138.88 pentagon u.s navy and other branches of the u.s government in 1996, he was caught by the Australian Federal Police and charged with over 30 counts of hacking and computer-related crimes. He didn't get any jail time, but he was fined $2,100. I think the first taste of what would come later was the hacking that he did as a young programmer, and that really sort of foreshadowed a healthy skepticism of the use and abuse of technology by government. That's Vernon Silver. I'm a reporter for Bloomberg's investigations team. Assange's youth as a hacker laid the foundation for him to start WikiLeaks in 2006. But what is WikiLeaks? It's a website that posts unfiltered, usually classified documents. What separates it from every other media outlet is that they have no editorial hierarchy. With a publication like the New York Times, information comes in, they take that information, package it, then disseminate it for the public to see. WikiLeaks, however, cuts out the middleman. WikiLeaks gathers information, most of it given to them anonymously. So what they're doing is really very simple. They get the information in one end from who gives it to them and out the other with sometimes minimal interference. Julian Assange is the leader of that, the mastermind, the creator, and really because he thinks of it as a journalistic enterprise, the editor-in-chief. But every story starts with a source, and Assange has some unconventional sources. Julian Assange does not hack as far as we know. He is the recipient of people who are either insiders who give him secret documents or hack emails from a foreign power. That's Eli Lake. I am a columnist for Bloomberg. And there was no source bigger for Assange than Chelsea Manning. He used to be known as U.S. soldier Bradley Manning. In 2010, Manning provided Assange and WikiLeaks with hundreds of thousands of leaked government documents. WikiLeaks quietly began releasing the documents in February of 2010 then made big headlines in April by posting what is now known as the collateral murder video. Come on, fire! It was a vivid graphic video. It changed the debate on the Iraq war, and importantly, it put WikiLeaks on the map when they put it online, and they couldn't be ignored at that point. And those leaks were just the beginning. They went on to post more than 90,000 leaked documents known as the Afghan war logs, 390,000 documents known as the Iraq war logs, and a quarter of a million private messages between diplomats called cables in what is now known as Cablegate. These leaks were met with very real ethical questions. The problem with publishing those cables was that a number of confidential sources for U.S. diplomats could face real danger when their names were exposed. Then Secretary of State Hillary Clinton drove the point home that every country, including the United States, must... And I'm placing a stop on profit at 138.86. Okay, stop on profit placed, 138.86. Okay, so if you follow the trade, you have to do the same. If you want to get the strategy, you can get it from red line. You can see red ticker, the website, web address, where you can get strategy from. Uh, if you want to follow, carry on following the trade, you're welcome. Just don't forget to follow trade and as we do, because if we play stop on profit, you need to place as well. Don't try, don't gamble, don't try to say, oh, well, I'm well in profit, I will not play stop on profit or something like that. Yeah, please, if you started to follow trades, please follow until the end. Okay, I'll speak to you later, guys.
20,000 confidential Democratic National Committee emails. In terms of the presidential race, if you look right here, when Assange released the first batch of emails, Trump actually takes his first lead against Clinton. I think we've had enough of the Clintons in all fairness. Once WikiLeaks started exposing secrets of the Democratic Party, Julian Assange became a hero to many on the right. Public opinion kind of flip-flopped. WikiLeaks! From the emails, we now know Hillary Clinton's campaign manager makes risotto, and also how the DNC squashed Bernie Sanders' campaign. One thing we don't know is who gave Assange the stolen emails in the first place. Many leading Democrats say they suspect it was the Russians. They released an analysis from a private cybersecurity firm that had said it was the Russians. But Assange claims... Our source uh, is not the Russian government, uh, and it is not the state party. So this is where we stand today. The public still doesn't know who provided the emails to WikiLeaks. Meanwhile, Assange is still running WikiLeaks. Position closed on British Pound. At 138.86. Well done, guys. It took us a couple of minutes to make a profit. So let's look for other pairs. Slowly but surely, we make money during this Monday. It's about their own hackability and. This entire video is based on a true story. When I do like motivational speeches or even tell myself like, love yourself and you should love yourself. This is Lily Singh.
fans all over the world. She's the YouTube star, Superwoman. What if everyone wants a girl? Superwoman. I know we can change the world for the better one positive day at a time. My parents now know what I do. <laughs> they didn't know what I did for a long time in the beginning of my career. I was just making videos in my room. They had no idea. Mom, Dad, have you seen my keys? I can't find them anywhere because you're always on phone. Until someone called them, like a family member from another part of Canada was like, Canada, is your daughter making videos? And my mom was like, I don't, I don't know, Lily or Lily, are you making videos? Just making videos grew into an entire career. Today, Lily's YouTube channel has some 12 million subscribers, over 2 billion views, and guest stars like Michelle Obama, Dwayne The Rock Johnson, and Seth Rogen. I think a lot of young girls are raised to believe that you're going to go to school and then graduate and then get married and then get a job and have kids. And Lily was on that path, all the way through a psychology degree at York University in Toronto. But when she started thinking about a career... I started to immensely panic and think something was wrong with me because I tried to figure out my life and it wasn't working in that straight line. It was 2010 and YouTube was only five years old. I thought nothing of YouTube. I, I was probably the last person in my circle of friends to discover YouTube. And I remember when I did, I thought, this is so strange. There's people making videos in the rooms and other people are watching them. So she figured, why not give it a shot? I one day posted a video because I was sad and I wanted to be creative and happy. She didn't know how to edit video or write scripts, so she winged it. It was so bad and so cringe, and my expectation was literally nothing. I was like, I'm gonna put this video up, a couple of my friends are gonna watch it, probably make fun of me, and that's gonna be the end of this. The second and third video came from, wait, 70 people watched my first one, can I get 80 to watch the next one? She kept creating, she kept posting, and the viewers kept coming. Lily had found an audience. A lot of the comments were, oh my God, there's a brown girl on YouTube. More specifically, Indian. Lily's parents immigrated to Canada from India, and Lily was born and raised in Scarborough, near Toronto. My home life was awesome. My parents, even though I portrayed them to be quite strict in my videos. Oh, Lily, wear the rest of your skirt, huh? I teach you like this, to walk around like this, showing everything to everyone. They actually aren't like that at all. They're pretty modern and pretty cool. Your dress is short. Don't know what for. And we're pretty lenient with me. I mean, I got to, I got away with a lot of things. I was a brat. This is, this is, the, I was a brat. She had a different idea of what she wanted out of life than other kids. In a grade school graduation slideshow, her classmates said they wanted to be lawyers and doctors. And then I came up and I was like, rapper. Looking out with your friends, man. But then you say that you hate hoes. I could just feel my parents being like, why? Because that's just not something women really did in the Singh family. I know there was a ton of people that weren't happy about my birth being a female, so I think, and that's some real-ish, but it's, it's, it's a real thing. The best thing I could have done to prove to so many people that didn't want my mom to have a daughter was to become Superwoman. What up, everyone? It's your girl, Superwoman. It was the name of Lily's favorite hip-hop song by Lil Mo featuring Fabulous. I love the song so much because it was one of the only songs at the time that was an empowering female song where Lil Mo's going on about like, I will save guys with my superpowers and I will save girls with my superpowers and I am the superwoman. I thought, this name that I've had for so long that empowered me when I was younger, I'm gonna make this my screen name. Maybe this should be a new series. Superwoman didn't just burst onto the scene overnight with a viral video. It was a steady climb fueled by hard work. The moment that I thought this is going somewhere and this could be a career was the first time I performed internationally. It was in India. And it was the first time where I was truly across the world and people knew my videos. Singh has transformed herself from a bratty kid to an internet personality to a media mogul. She started a feature film, A Trip to Unicorn Island, in 2016. And her book, How to Be a Boss, hit the New York Times bestseller list in 2017 while she was on a 30-city international tour. Lily started out with the goal of getting millions of subscribers and financial security. Hurry the hell up! But after surpassing those goals, success has new meaning. I really come to terms with the fact that my, my definition of success is what's the best legacy I can leave behind. And it's not the number of views, the number of subscribers. It is the number of people that can say, this girl changed my life or changed something in my life positively.
is often found in the brains of deceased athletes, military veterans, and others with a history of repetitive brain trauma. Hundreds have donated their brains to the VA Boston University Concussion Legacy Foundation Brain Bank. This is a former NFL player who died in his early 70s. And this is a, a veteran uh, who also died in his early 70s. Dr. Ann McKee dissects these brains. The hippocampus and the mammillary bodies are very important for memory. I can see that they're slightly affected. McKee recently dissected the brain of former New England Patriots player Aaron Hernandez, who was convicted of murder and later committed suicide. And you'll see right away that the brain is showing signs of shrinkage. You can see the crevices in the brain that you can't see in the normal. McKee says Hernandez's severe case of CTE impacted his decision-making, depression, and ability to control rage and aggression. Right now, she thinks we're underestimating how many people have CTE. We were able to distinguish between CTE and controls and CTE and Alzheimer's disease the next question is, can we do this in the blood and can we do this in living people? And we aren't there yet with those answers. But the need for a diagnosis in the living is motivating companies such as Quanterix in Lexington, Massachusetts, to work faster on technology that could diagnose concussions and CTE in as few as 30 minutes. Kevin Rosovsky is the CEO. It's like a high-powered microscope. And so by doing that, we can see little biomarkers that you couldn't see before in the blood. Quanterix received a grant from the NFL and just went public. Since then, its stock is up more than 40%. The company sells a machine called Samoa for $175,000 to other biotechs, hospitals, and researchers. And for the first time in history, we're able to see brain health in blood, and that's a major breakthrough, and that's leading to less invasive testing, and we've already been able to see evidence of concussions, and there's the beginning evidence of being able to see the accumulated effect of concussions. Quanterix is also trying to detect Alzheimer's disease, multiple sclerosis, and ALS. Rosovsky says he thinks diagnosing concussions will be easier than diagnosing CTE. Diagnosing CT in the living probably is a couple years away. We're real excited to see the progress, but reducing some of that work into actual tests in a laboratory takes time. There's regulatory approvals. There's a lot of um, red tape that you have to go through. Also in this race to diagnose CTE in the blood are Athlon Medical and Exosome Sciences. And New York's Mount Sinai Hospital is scanning for the disease in the living. But it's just one step in a series of questions for those with serious head trauma. There's still no cure for CTE. Even if we had a great idea for a treatment, there's no way to test if, whether it's effective or not. So that's the enormous advance that we'll get if we can develop a biomarker for this disease. In Boston and Mostu, Bloomberg News.
Wine is a $300 billion global industry where one person's opinion can make fortunes or break them. That's because of this man, Robert Parker, and his newsletter, The Wine Advocate. For three decades, he dominated as the world's most influential wine critic. Now Parker's protege is building an empire of his own. Antonio Galloni runs Venice. Antonio, tell me, what are you trying to build at Venice? Well, Venice, we started with the idea uh, in 2013 of building a world-class platform. We have a database of about 250,000 professionally written reviews. On Delectable, we have 7 million user reviews. De through Delectable, we also have a partnership with Whole Foods and several other partnerships that we can't announce just yet. And when you put that all together, what we have is something that no other company in our space can even come close to. Do you think of yourself as the next Parker? Not at all. Why? Uh, because Steve Jobs said you can't live your life trying to be somebody else. So that, he's one of my biggest influences, and I've never wanted to be a replica of somebody else because a replica is never as good as the original. Bob is a, a genius, fantastic, one of a kind. Um, we're going to be something completely different, and I have no, no desire to be some version of somebody else. Different in what way? Um, every decision that I've made at this company is completely <laughs> anathemic to what Bob did with his company. Um, I want our writers to be partners. All of my senior people are locked into the company. They all have equity or they have a path to equity based on business results. That's something that we never had at Parker. Our, our benefits are world class. Uh, and everything that we've done at Venice is completely different from that model. When Steve Tanzer, who is the most experienced active wine critic in America, wants to work with us, that says something. When Alessandro Masnaghetti, who's the best cartographer of wine vi of, of vineyards, wants to work with us, that says something. When Neil Martin, who's a superstar wine critic with enormous experience in Bordeaux and Burgundy and the former lead critic at The Advocate, wants to come and be part of our team, that says something. You make it sound like The Wine Advocate was a disaster as a company and a miserable experience as an employee. No, it was, it was great because I got to work with Bob Parker when he was at his prime. You know, and Bob was like a second father to me, and we talked on the phone all the time, and he gave me great advice. Can anyone's palate dominate the wine criticism business the way Parker's did? And should anyone's palate dominate it the way he did? I just think the world is very different today. You know, the, I mean, it's just a totally different world. It's probably not healthy to have a single person dominating the world. The, the, it's not even wine criticism, it's the wine industry. Yeah, it's prob that's probably not the healthiest thing in the world. Um, but I think that there's just such an opportunity right now with social media and technology to reach such a massive number of people that I think it's possible that one or two people will actually have more influence than Bob Parker did. Because they will, they will again, this goes back to your first question, not trying to be a version of somebody else. You see this in sports all the time. It's like, oh, well, nobody will ever beat this record. And then somebody comes along. You know, it was like tennis, Pete Sampras. Nobody's ever going to win as many Grand Slams. I have two guys who are ahead of that and one knocking on the door. And, and so I think a lot like that. You're a former investment banker. How does that inform and influence what you're doing and what you've done? My generation has had to deal with a lot more challenges. That's why I think we're actually much better poised for the future. My first job in finance, the first thing that happened was long-term capital, 1998. <laughs> then the tech bubble melted down. Then there was a uh, mutual fund trading scandal. You know, that was all like within about five or six years. And these are the things that I had to deal with as a young executive. My peers who were 20 years older didn't know how to manage in crisis. They'd only seen Black Monday. They'd just been in a big bull market. It's very different. So I, I'm very lucky. People of my generation or a little bit younger have actually had to deal with a lot more crises. I think that's actually good for learning how to cope with challenges in business. From the outside, it kind of looks like you're trying to demolish the house that Parker built, right? You left the wine advocate. Yeah. You merged with one of his chief rivals. Yeah. And you just hired his successor, Neil Martin. Mm -hmm. So are you? I think what that says is that all the best people want to work at our company. And that's really what we strive to create starting in 2013. We wanted to create a world-class company that would attract the best in class talent. And not just on the content side, on the technology side, on the digital side, our office. And at every level, what we're trying to, we only hire superstars and we're looking for those superstars.
In the world of professional wrestling, there's something called a swerve. Hulk Hogan has betrayed WCW! Some examples. These tag team partners are called baby faces, or the good guys. Then one of them swerves when he super kicks his tag team partner in the head, quickly assuming the role of the bad guy, or what the wrestling world calls the heel. Are you kidding? What a despicable act that was! Or a match is almost lost when, what's that? the superstar wrestler appears out of nowhere sprinting down the aisle to save the match. It's the Warriors music! It's the ultimate warrior! That's a swerve. So it should go as no surprise that World Wrestling Entertainment, known as the WWE, the most popular brand of sports entertainment in the world, is prepared for any swerves that come their way. So here's the story of how the WWE learned to see the swerve coming. So I spoke to Bloomberg reporters Felix Gillette. I'm a writer for Bloomberg News for the Global Business Team. And Kim Basin. And I'm the U.S. luxury reporter at Bloomberg. To find out exactly how the WWE is positioning itself for an all-out global invasion, which starts with a massive change to their lucrative pay-per-view model. WWE basically pioneered the pay-per-view model on cable. I remember as a kid, when the pay-per-view events came up, all of our friends would scramble around and try and get one of the parents to, to pay for it. But in 2014, they took a huge risk. They saw a little bit sooner than some of the other entertainment brands that where this whole thing was moving was away from cable and satellite television and towards on-demand streaming video apps. They made this risky decision, in essence, cannibalizing that pay-per-view model, which they had essentially built. And after some early turbulence, it's working. Roughly 1.5 million people are paying $9.99 a month for the WWE app, making it the fifth most popular streaming OTT service. This adapt or die approach is in the WWE's DNA. Over the past 30 years, the company always seems to think two steps ahead. In the early 90s, WWE was at its most threatened when Ted Turner took them on with WCW, which stands for World Championship Wrestling. And back then, the WCW was winning the ratings war. So in order to compete with them, WWE had changed its product from a family-friendly kind of cartoonish style to this really raw. That's why they called their show Raw. It was this raw style of, of, of wrestling. With violent, outrageous, reality-inspired plot lines and aggressive personas. From a 16-foot ladder! And they won that fight against Ted Turner. And they bought WCW. The early 2000s ushered in an era of testosterone-driven programming aimed at the red-blooded American male. Bra and panties matches and people smash each other over their head with, with like barbed wire bats and things like that. Until 2015, when WWE fans started a hashtag, Give Divas a Chance. Since then, WWE has hired 40 more female wrestlers. And that growing cast of female characters was part of a much larger plan. They started to try to appeal to a broader set of people. Let's attract more female fans. And after we've attracted more female fans, let's attract more international fans. They're broadening their base, and they're doing that in large part to make it more advertising friendly. And not just friendly to advertisers. They're trying to build up their fan base in China. They're trying to build up their fan base in Europe. They, you know, already have a pretty good fan base in India. India is a place where they already have an established wrestling culture because of the gigantic Indian wrestler, the great Kali. But there's still a lot of work to do. While the WWE set a revenue record in 2017, only 30% of it is coming from an overseas audience. And there's one person whose responsibility is to grow that number. The buck eventually stops at Vince McMahon, no matter what's happening within WWE. Yeah, he's a very controlling guy, and it's a very, very, very tightly scripted company. And that goes all the way down the board to the big stars' entrance music. <laughs> and their, their outfits and things like that. So with a CEO like McMahon always planning two moves ahead and an aggressive push into multiple international markets, a big issue is money. It's hard to do all those things simultaneously without committing a huge amount of capital to it. And that's where the WWE becomes an attractive company for buyers. Potentially, one thing that could happen with WWE is they could benefit by being acquired by a bigger technology or telecom company, an Amazon or Facebook. Facebook or 
a 21st Century Fox. So with a market cap of $2.8 billion, the advantage of owning 100% of their own content and a rapid consolidation spreading throughout the entertainment industry, it looks like the WWE is well positioned, even if there are swerves ahead. Our world is changing. Every day, it changes a little faster. Some changes are too small to see. Others, too big to handle. Sometimes, change feels slow. So slow, we don't even notice. Other times, it happens all at once. And we can't keep up. For our climate, change means many things. And between too small to see and too big to handle, there is a whole world of difference. The clock is ticking. This is Bloomberg Green. Saving the seas. This week, the deep sea diver who stopped riding the ocean's obituary to find a solution. And Rick Sala tells us why the next 10 years matter most. And globalization needs to get greener. Shipping accounts for nearly an eighth of all transport emissions. How can the industry clean up its act? Plus, protecting coastlines comes at a huge environmental cost. But one Israeli startup found a way to keep the sea out and the animals in. From London, I'm Anne-Marie Hordern, and this is Bloomberg Green. After more than a decade of studying the ocean as an academic, Enric Sala realized he was writing the ocean's obituary. He quit his job and became a full-time conservationist. As an in-house explorer for National Geographic, he's clocked more than 5,000 open water dives. He's also founded Pristine Seas, a project that combines exploration, research, and media to lobby countries to protect their oceans. To date, it has helped create marine reserves equivalent to half the size of Canada. I spoke to him about his mission and why it's so urgent. The state of the world's oceans is really bad. We have lost 90% of the large fish in the ocean. Sharks, groupers, cod, tuna. More than half of the fish stocks are overfished, which means that we are taking them out of the water faster than they can reproduce. More than half of the ocean is affected by industrial fishing and global warming is killing coral reefs all around the world. The ocean is in a trajectory of decline. Can you just visualize for our viewers who never get to see the kind of things you are able to see, what an ocean and healthy ecosystem looks like versus one that's next to a bustling economic and industrialized area? Coral reefs in the United States, in the Florida Keys, are down to only 2% of what they used to be. Before, 80 to 90% of the bottom on a coral reef in the Caribbean was covered by live coral. Now, Florida Keys have only 2%. The average in the Caribbean is about 5% of the bottom covered by live coral. The rest is covered by slime and seaweed. And most of the fish you can see are this big. And it is very, very rare that if you jump into any place in the Caribbean at random, you see a shark. It's very, very rare. Now, let's go to Millennium Atoll, for example. An atoll that is uninhabited and fished south of the equator in the Central Pacific it belongs to the Republic of Kiribati. 2009, we conducted the first, the first underwater expedition to this island. And I still remember the first time. Jumped over the side of the boat. And as soon as the bubbles cleared, I was surrounded by 15 gray reef sharks. After a couple minutes, the sharks decided that we were boring and they went back to do their thing. And you look down, 90% of the seafloor is covered by thriving coral. And it's full of fish and a sea turtle comes by. Now this abundance that we rarely see anywhere except in well-managed marine reserves. This is what the ocean used to be like, and this is what we have learned from going to these pristine places. And you write in your book that you're writing the obituary of ocean life. What's the cure? The cure is doing less harm. Basically, there are three things that we are doing to the ocean. One is we are taking fish out of the water faster than they can reproduce. Two, we are turning the ocean warmer and more acidic because of man-made climate change. And three, we are throwing in everything that we don't want, our waste and our plastic. We need basically to reverse these trends. Does this mean that a lot of this falls to governments and their policies? That's a big part of it because it is governments that regulate fishing and mineral extraction and oil extraction. 
his government that have the legal authority to create large marine reserves in the ocean. But also local communities have an important role to play because some of the most successful protected areas in the ocean are community led and community managed marine reserves. So when the fish come back, the divers come in and that creates huge economic opportunities through ecotourism. These areas that are managed by communities are very successful because the communities have a vested interest in having as many fish as possible inside them so they can enjoy the benefits. What from the pandemic has changed your view when it comes to protection of the environment? Nature has given us a very strong signal of how fast it can recover if we just give it space. Everybody was fascinated by all these videos of the whales and the dolphins coming into marinas and mountain lions on the streets of Santiago in Chile, wild goats in the UK. Nature has this extraordinary ability to bounce back if we just give it space. This is why we need to protect at least 30% of the planet by 2030. How do healthy marine ecosystems help in the fight against climate change though? Most people see the ocean as a victim of climate change, but the ocean can also be a solution because we know that the more life that is in the ocean, like big fish and big whales, the more these organisms help to make the ocean productive and absorb more CO2. The kelp forest, seagrass beds, all of these are important ecosystems in the ocean that are similar to the forests on the land that capture a lot of our carbon pollution. What are you most excited about in your field? So we have 10 years to fix this problem. Global fisheries catch is going down, the stocks are collapsing. Business as usual means that by 2050, 90% of the coral reefs are gone, that most commercial fisheries have collapsed. That affects food security, that affects a migration of people. We have 10 years to get to peak greenhouse gas emissions and then go carbon neutral by 2050. And we have 10 years to protect at least 30% of the ocean so we can restore much of this health and productivity not just for saving biodiversity, but also saving our life support system. We are not talking about something that is apart from us. We are not apart from nature. We are a part of nature. So these 10 years are probably the most critical in the history of humanity. The most accurate measurements of changing oceans will come from space. While Enric Sala explores what lies beneath, a new satellite is giving us data from above. We'll learn more about our oceans and climate change, but from space. A new satellite's been launched from California. Its mission, track the accelerating rise of sea levels. Well, the main instruments on board uh, include a dual frequency radar altimeter. Um, this is the primary instrument of the mission, and that's the one that's measuring sea surface height, significant wave height, and wind speed over the ocean. And from those measurements, we can actually have uh, the superb measurements that we expect um, of sea level rise. Data gathered from Sentinel-6 will be used alongside information from other satellites to build as complete a picture of the oceans as possible. With a, a, a long record, we can precisely uh, measure the acceleration. We eventually can detect new regime, tipping points. For example, if there is a runaway in the melting of uh, Greenland or Antarctica, sea level uh, will uh, record this uh, runaway change uh, because it is an integrator of all changes that are occurring in the, in the climate system. So we, we will be able to see some, some change, big change, in, uh, in the global climate. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration expects that sea level rise will increasingly threaten U.S. coastlines. One example, the southern tip of Manhattan is expected to flood 20 to 40 times a year by 2030. 11 uh, of the 15 largest mega cities are located at the coast, and this number will double in, um, I mean, the, the number of um, uh, people living in, in coastal area will double in, by uh, 2060. So uh, it, knowing how much sea level is rising at the coast and how much it will rise in the future uh, in coastal areas is as uh, obvious. Uh, it, it's obviously a major goal uh, for for human being. Coming up, from sails to steam to oil, the shipping industry is no stranger to change. 
but how will it navigate the next transition? This is Bloomberg Green. From Bloomberg's European headquarters in London, I'm Anne-Marie Hordern. This is Bloomberg Green. Now for your roundup of this week's latest climate news, Jennifer Zabazaja has your green in brief. Here's the climate news you need to know. Deforestation of the world's largest rainforest has hit a 12-year high. More than 4,000 square miles of the Amazon rainforest was destroyed in 2020. That's a 9.5% increase from a year earlier. Government data shows that destruction has soared since President Jair Bolsonaro took office and weakened environmental enforcement. The Amazon is home to millions of species and plants and is critical in the fight against climate change. Bitcoin is hitting all-time highs, but at what cost to the environment? The cryptocurrency is energy intensive and there are concerns if it becomes mainstream. According to MIT, back in 2018, Bitcoin's carbon footprint was almost as big as Portugal's. Want to get better at tackling climate change? We'll hire more women. That's according to Bloomberg New Energy Finance. Firms with 30% or more women in top jobs tend to perform better when it comes to the environment and are more likely to set clear climate goals. Shopping online is more popular than ever now, but the price of convenience is measured in CO2, and more deliveries means more fuel burned and more packaging wasted. So what can companies do? Well, many are becoming more efficient and sourcing more clean energy for their data centers and warehouses. And England's farmers will be paid to go green after Brexit. As European subsidies are phased out, they'll get new money to encourage them to produce healthy, sustainable food. Poor farming practices are one of the leading drivers of water pollution and the loss of biodiversity. I'm Jennifer Zabasaja in New York. Anne-Marie, back to you. The shipping industry is more than just the grease on the wheels of globalization. It's its chief enabler. 11 billion tons of goods are transported by ship each year. The biggest contributors being 2 billion tons of oil, 1 billion tons of iron ore, and 350 million tons of grain. According to the International Chamber of Shipping, 80% of Europe's imports and exports happen over the seas. And for such a vast industry, it also contributes its fair share of emissions. Shipping makes up 12% of global transport energy consumption. So how does it clean up its act? Earlier, I caught up with Bloomberg Green reporter Laura Milan about just how big of a challenge this is going to be for the industry. 
one of the main issues is size. So um, about 90% of the world's cargo is moved by ships. So obviously changing such a huge uh, industry is not going to be fast and it's not going to be easy. The second issue is uh, has to do with technology. So uh, ships obviously uh, travel for many days at sea. It's not as easy for them to refuel as it would be for a car, for example, going on a road. And the sector still hasn't found a technology that's economically viable and that's uh, zero emissions and equivalent to, to the electric batteries for cars, for example. But actions are being put in place to make the industry a bit more environmentally friendly. Walk us through those steps that they're taking. That's it. So um, there's a, a first step that would involve uh, using low emission fuels or uh, biofuels that would significantly reduce the existing emissions. And then at a regulatory level, when it comes to the policy and the governments, there are steps being made as well. I would say that the most significant ones come from the European Union, which started to track emissions a few years ago and is now looking to include shipping emissions in the emissions trading system system. So that would significantly reduce and, and help calculate uh, the emissions from the shipping industry. Now, uh, China is taking similar steps. So at the moment, regions need to report shipping emissions to the central government. And finally, we have the International Maritime Organization with a pledge to reduce uh, shipping emissions by 50% in 2050. Now, we must say that that pledge uh, has been considered insufficient by environmental groups, but at least some steps are being taken. So to get to 2050, the industry obviously is going to start tapping some new technologies. What new technologies are you seeing being introduced into the shipping industry? So we have seen pilot technologies being developed for years now, but what's interesting about this current moment is that we're seeing big players invest uh, in these technologies that are not yet economically viable, but that one day might be. So for example, we are seeing uh, earlier this year the world's largest agricultural commodities trader, Cargill, saying they will invest in attaching sails to their ships uh, so they can make any technology that they run their ships on more efficient. Similarly, we have seen a spin-off of Airbus, the aeronautics company, developing a similar application with kites. We have been following also developments in hydrogen. So at the moment, hydrogen fuel seems like a good option, a, a possible option when, when it has been uh, developed and when it becomes uh, economically viable. And we have Vestas, for example, the world's largest uh, turbine maker, developing some ships that will be able to run on hydrogen in the near future. Coming up, rising sea levels means humans need to get creative when it comes to coastal defenses. But how do we protect both ourselves and the environment? One Israeli startup may have the answer. That's coming up next. This is Bloomberg Green. London, I'm Anne-Marie Hordern. This is Bloomberg Green. After water, what's the resource that humans use the most? It's concrete, three tons a year for every person on the planet. And engineers estimate it's used twice as much as all other building materials combined. And it comes with a huge environmental cost. Concrete, not just in cities, it's a common feature on our coastlines too. And that's taking a toll on biodiversity. But one Israeli startup has found a way of making sea defenses stronger and encouraging life to thrive. If you take a look at concrete structures like breakwaters or seawalls, the water around them is often clear. That's not actually a good thing because it means there's no life. 
marine species are actually most abundant in coastal areas.